Greetings to you that are watching the program today. I hope the message will be a blessing to you. You will turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. I uh, want to deal with us today on peace versus being scared. In this troublous time, people uh, are looking for answers, obviously. Answers, what should I do? Do I do this against somebody else or whatever, <clears throat> like opening a business or whatever, and, and they're scared. But our main concern here in this message is there's a lot of fear in this world, but we want peace from God. That's what, that's what we need. And so I'm going to read you in Romans 10, verse 13, and... If I don't get this over to you, it'd be my failure, and I apologize, but I want you to I want you to think about God in this situation. In Romans 10, 13, Paul said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wonderful verse. But we have to have some understanding on how do I call on God? How, what would I say to him? Uh, what would I do to get his attention? Uh, is he listening? And uh we have a wonderful verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'll read that to you right now, and then I'll come back to Romans 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, we then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. God helped us, and I want to go through this, how he helped us. He, he knew our condition. Obviously, God is not confused with things going on. I mean, nothing's new here about it. He's seeing it all. And he helped us. And, and back in Romans 10, whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord should be saved, okay? If that was the only verse I had, I would find the name of the Lord and I'd call on it. But why am I calling on it? I have to look at the scriptures to see. Now, this is called the Roman Road of Salvation, but what I want to see is verse four, 13, uh, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? So you'd have to believe that he exists. You have to believe that God is there, that none of this has upset God. None of this is a surprise to God. And you come to a point in your life that you can't save yourself and you really can't get peace. There's no peace to the wicked, saith the Lord. So he says, how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? So you're not just going to believe on your own. You're going to hear it. You're going to hear about God. And a uh, beautiful verse that Paul writes in the Galatian letter is that the Gentiles, the heathen, wouldn't know Jesus Christ if it hadn't been revealed to Paul. And that's very clear in Galatians 1.15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now, we live in a world that they think that God is Confucius. They think that God is Allah. They think that God is Buddha. They think that uh, Hindu, uh, they just think of God as different ways and they've made images of him and all that. That's not God. God is the creator of heaven and earth. God has no problem whatsoever taking care of his world. And yes, he made good and evil. The scripture says so. He made peace. He made all those things. Uh, he made the devil. You, all, you, you always ask, why did the Lord make the devil? Well, all things work in a purpose. God has a purpose for all of it. And what God truly wants is somebody that will worship him as God with the ability of God as the creator of heaven and earth, the one that holds the heavens and the earth together by his word. He wants somebody to worship him as that because he will not share his glory with any other. So in uh, Romans 10 again, verse thir uh, 14 he said, How shall they call him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Well, we got it laid down. If God don't send a preacher, 
you're not going to believe. The preacher has to preach what God wants to be pre preached. Uh, if he doesn't, then it is not the calling of God. And there's a lot of people that think they were called that aren't preachers, obviously. There are a lot of people that think they were called by that preacher that wasn't preaching to them the gospel of peace. How do I know? Verse 15, he said, uh, How shall they preach except they be sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. And here it comes, of peace. Not hellfire and brimstone. Hellfire and brimstone was preached when I was a boy. And it was to get you to fear, to get you to do some action, to get you up out of a out of a, a pew seat and down the aisle because you were scared to death that hellfire was waiting for you and all that. But the gospel of peace is what's to be preached. God has been and did the work necessary. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. If the world is reconciled, then the preacher is supposed to show people that they've been reconciled to God. They've been brought to God through the work of God, and it's called his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10, and that workmanship is through the faith of his son. His son was the only righteous individual to ever live on the earth. He did the law. He did everything according to God's word. He was righteous. And the righteousness of God, his son, could be put to your account and my account if we believe on what God did. Well, what did he do? He, God, made him the Lord to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Not, not be righteous, be made the righteous of God. We're a made individual. We're made the righteousness of God in him. And if we believe that, but we'd have to hear it. We have to hear the gospel of peace, the good news of our peace with God. And that's what I want to deal with. I want to talk about the peace of God. Now, peace in the Bible would be if we were enemies, um, as in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, verse uh, 6, Romans 5, 6 says, for... Uh, when, uh, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8, but God committed his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that would totally eliminate, by the way, confession of sin or the sinner's prayer. If God don't know you're a sinner, he ain't God anyway, then why would you worship him? God has the ability to know because he's God. He created man out of the dust of the earth, and he knows man's life, and he foresees all knows all and does all and he knew we were sinners i don't have to tell him a sinner that's like slapping him in the face god you didn't know i'm a sinner the sinner's prayer is worthless you don't have to tell god you're a sinner he says in verse 8 god commends his love toward us and while we were yet sinners christ died for us now verse 10 for if when we were enemies okay so now i find out that i was an enemy of god Pardon me, that might give me a little trouble. For when I was an enemy of God, God was doing his work even though I was an enemy. I mean, I wasn't doing something right or getting in the right position or getting to the right correct thought of mind or, or, or getting, getting my life straight, you might say, and repenting and turning from my sins. I was an enemy when God was doing what he was doing. I mean, you got to see the mercy and the kindness in this about God. When I was an enemy of God, he was still taking care of me by the death of his son. Why? He, God, made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteous God in him. Uh, Christ, the gospel says that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and that he was buried and they rose again on the third day according to scripture. He wasn't dying for good people. There is none good. There is none that doeth good. He wasn't dying for an individual that understands. He wasn't dying for a person that was righteous, that does righteous. There is none righteous. He's dying for ungodly sinners and enemies. And in doing so, if we will believe, but how do we believe? Well, it has to be presented to us. It has to be preached to us. And it, the preacher has to be led of God to preach this, and it's called the gospel of peace. 
So what was the gospel of Peter? Christ died for our sins according to Scripture and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scripture. All right, now turn to Proverbs 3 and watch. Let's see a statement here in Proverbs chapter 3. And it's a beautiful thought when you think about what Proverbs 3 is thinking. In Proverbs 3, um, he says in verse 13, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Understanding is the thing that we need to consider. Understanding is very important, yet the people around us, Gentiles, don't have the understanding. Uh, it is very uh, important that I read that to you in a minute, but I want to read verse 14. For the merchandise of it, understanding and wisdom, is better than merchandise of silver and the gain thereof of, of fine gold. She, that's wisdom and understanding, she is more precious than rubies, and all the things that Kenneth desire are not to be compared with her. Length of days in her right hand, and her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Now we're supposed to trust in the Lord with all our heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all our ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct our paths. This is in the same chapter, verse 5 and 6. So to trust in the Lord with all my heart, I got quit. I, I got to think about the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. How can I trust in the Lord with all my heart? Well, it's not my understanding. It is his understanding. It is the understanding of the Lord. That's the only way that I'll ever have a way to I don't know how to say it. Peace is the word. Of yet, I want to say the understanding that even though things are going wrong or sour or bad around me or to me, the understanding gives me peace because I know that God has it all in hand. God is not fooled by this. God is not upset by this. God in his infinite wisdom already knew the things that were going to happen and he, it's in the preparation for his will to be done in all things I can't help but think about Jesus Christ in the garden of Gethsemane as he's praying there the sweat is as great drops of blood he's, he's in terrible misery and what he's looking at is not just the death he's looking at his soul going into hell and suffering the just for the unjust and then having to wait for the Father to raise him from the dead by faith. And that's misery. Well, as we dwell on this earth, there are evil men and there are uh, vile bodies that work against God in every way possible. And in their evilness and their vileness, they concoct things that actually will destroy people, hurt people, make people miserable. But in all of that, God says we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. And it's not wrong that we are scared. We've been made to be scared. Things around us are making us scared. Uh, you can go along as a tough guy for a while, but then it'll get to you because it's scary what things are being done now, and they were scary things uh, in the Holocaust when the Jews were being taken away. There were scary things in the Crusades when uh, the Christians and, uh, and the things that were going on. But you understand, as we're scared, we also have the right of peace and the knowledge of peace, which is the understanding. So he says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. So quit thinking about what your heart's trying to tell you and trying to guide you and show you Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. You don't understand, so go to his word and let him give you understanding. And save people have the right to the understanding because it's the understanding they've been given. And uh, it comes down to the fact that uh, when all hell breaks loose, and I mean that in a statement, when all things break loose, even though we can't, get away from our fear and scared and upset and all that we can go to passages such as in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 7 8 and 9 
and understand that if we'll meditate on the things that are pure and good, then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds. And I want to try to deal with that in this. Uh, Looking for Philippians, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says that there is a walk in this world. And I am not a brave man. Uh, I am a fearful individual just like any other human being. I fear sickness. I fear uh, diseases. I fear the things that are going on around me now by the fear mongering and the things that are happening. But I have to look at God's word for help. Uh, there's no help otherwise. Uh, the world's not going to help me. Other men may not be able to help me. Now, other preachers can help me when I listen to them if they have the gospel of peace. But as far as having uh, fear, it's there. And there's and scared, being scared of things is a normal thing. If you're not scared of certain things, some things can hurt you. I have a, I have, I'm scared of certain things, yes. But in Ephesians chapter 4, he says in verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart. The blindness of the heart, we can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and uh, 3 and see the blindness of the heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says in verse um, 16, uh, 15, I apologize. Now I'm going to go back to verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. And of course, Moses delivered the law, but their minds were blinded, for in this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it, that's the heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty from the fear of the law and what the law would do to you. Well, let's think of the spirit of Christ in us. If we come to a day and age when all hell is breaking loose and there's fear going all around us and there's evil men working things against people, um, then the spirit of the Lord can also work in us a peace. Turn to Philippians chapter 4 again and let's look at it in Philippians 4. Too many times people meditate on everything but the right thing. In Philippians chapter 4, um, you can't trust men. Men will lie. Let God be true and every man a liar. So what does he say in Philippians 4? 4, 4? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men that the Lord is at hand. Your moderation is your yieldingness to the truth of God versus what's going on around you. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God. Now, there is two verses in this Bible that talk about peace that are so distinct. I want you to hold this and go to Romans chapter 5. And this is going to bring clarity to our standing and state before God. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I need peace with God before I can ever have the peace of God. Now, the peace with God here in this verse comes from the fact that God is no longer going to pour his wrath out on us. He is no longer going to condemn us. He's no longer going to do uh, hell and death to us and the lake of fire for us. We're at peace with God because Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. And if we trust that and believe that, according to Romans chapter 10, having heard, uh, having heard the gospel of peace, then we can clarify that in Ephesians chapter 1, the scripture says in verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace when he has made us accepted in the beloved. We're accepted in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the, most, he was the only righteous person to ever live. And in his righteousness, he was willing to give up that righteousness in the sense, giving up his life that he might deliver us from this present evil world. We're delivered from this present evil world and will be delivered from this present evil world. And giving himself 
he died for our sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. And when God raised him, he had justified and forgave us. And those are cleared in, in verses. But in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Our faith is not what guarantees any of this. It's his faith that settled the issue. Now, we have to believe in him. Galatians chapter 2, we have to believe in Jesus, but we can't believe in Jesus without what he has done for us first. Uh, just believing in Jesus as the Son of God and maybe walking the aisle and joining the church or getting baptized or anything you did in that church and turned from your sins, said the sinner of prayer, asked Jesus in heart, that is not what this is about. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. There's no law that you could get justified in the, guy, in the eyes of God. And that's very clear. I'll read that verse to you really clear. In Romans chapter 3, Paul says, in accordance to the law, he says, uh, verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So you can't be justified by keeping the law. You can't be made right because you say you keep the Ten Commandments. You can't be made right. You can't be at peace with God because of your actions or what you did. It says in uh, Galatians 2.20, uh, 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Long before we were ever born or even thought of, Jesus Christ had faith enough to go to Calvary and become sin and die for us, go into hell for three days and then be raised again, and that was his faith. So it says that we, uh, uh, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. So in AD 33, the provision of our justification was made. Now it was made. That's still not yours. It's not yours until you believe. But how do you believe? How should they believe in him and whom they've not heard? So then you see in verse 16, even we have believed in Jesus. You see you've got of Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, and then you're going to have of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. How would you do that? You heard. How shall they believe in him whom not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So a preacher is supposed to be telling you that it was the faith of Jesus Christ that settled the issue for you. He gave you peace with God. Now understand this that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. So there comes a time in biblical history when somebody else's faith cleared the path for you. That was the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. He went to Calvary. He died for our sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. Upon that, that's going to be available to us by the preaching by a sent preacher who's going to preach the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace is that somebody else justified us. The day that you hear it, somebody says, well, I get upset with people that tell me they have a day of their salvation, the day of their uh, when they trusted. Well, obviously you would. You'd have to hear it. May the 17th, 1984, I've heard for the first time in my mind, not the first time I ever heard it, but the first time it came to a right to a point to me is, that it wasn't my faith, it wasn't my activity. You see, I long before that had cut my hair and shaved my beard and quit drinking and, and quit going places and was doing the best I could. And Then I got into a ministry and I thought being in a ministry was without my salvation. None of that had anything to do with the justification of Christ. The justification of Christ came when he was made sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteous of God in him. It was the workmanship of God. So that day that Jesus did that was long before I was born. The day that I heard it, I believed in it, and then God imputed it to me. He sealed me with it. He sealed me with that Holy Spirit that was given because Jesus Christ had died, was buried, and rose again the third day. Well, then I ask people, I say, when were you justified? Well, most people say, well, at reading that, they'll say, well, I'm justified when Christ died for my sins. No, when were you justified? You see, you can learn something by this verse. Look at verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, 
For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Very clear. Now, the God of this world, Satan, would obviously try to put works, the Ten Commandments, or things that you could do to get to Jesus, uh, to God. But you have to go through Jesus Christ. So how do you go through him? Well, in accordance with the verses, I have to trust. There has to be a day. Well, Romans 8. In Romans chapter 8, yes, there is a day in my life when I trusted Christ. I heard the gospel of my salvation. I want Romans 8, and I want to get Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle Paul says, in verse 13, In whom you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. You're sealed the day you hear it and trust it. Not the day that you believed that Jesus was the Son of God or that you got baptized or you joined the church and said the sinner's prayer. And, uh, you know, they all tell you, now you say the sinner's prayer with us and that'll be your salvation. Now write to us and tell us when you did this. I don't know. No. The day you get sealed is the day that you trust that God justified you and that you're at peace with him. Now, that's exactly what it talks about. And in Romans chapter 8, um, verse um, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are thee called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow. Now, we're going to be able to trust God to be able to foreknow, to look out there, even though the things that are going on around us today, you know, the evilness and the lying and whatever else is going on and the scare tactics that's being put on us and everybody's afraid, you know they are, you can watch them and see. Are we going to be able to look at this verse and think that all things work together for good by the foreknowledge of God, verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, can you look at yourself and say, God, did you see me? Did you foreknow me? If you're being preached to, he's trying to show you he did. That's why we're on the air. We are preaching to you the gospel of peace. You're at peace with God if you want to be. It's your choice, not by what you do, but by trust. And you can only trust him if you hear. And you can hear right now, you are hearing. If you walk away from this message and you don't trust it, you didn't want it, and you receive not the love of the truth, and one day you'll be damned because God did everything there was to do for you, including calling you, and you rejected it. And why would he not laugh at you later? He would because you rejected the love of his son, the love of God, the salvation of Christ, uh, the, the justification of Christ when God raised him from the dead. His son literally went to hell for you, died on a cross and went to hell for you and spent three days in misery and torment that you might be justified and at peace with God. Why would you not receive that? Why wouldn't you junk your religion or anything you've ever done that's kept you from truly seeing that or where you've been going didn't preach that to you and trust it for the first time in your life? God's given you the opportunity to trust it. God's given you the opportunity to just trust him for his justification, for his salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Get a hold of the verse, not of yourselves. It wasn't your walk in the aisle. It wasn't your turning from your sins. It wasn't saying the sinner's prayer. It wasn't going to church. It wasn't trying to be a nice person to your neighbor. It wasn't any of that. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And grace is of uh, faith. It has to be of faith. I'm going to read you that, that verse in Romans chapter 4. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. If it's not the faith of Christ, it's not grace. And you may not have ever known that it was the faith of Christ that got you justification. But it was. It wasn't your faith. It didn't have anything to do with your faith until you heard of the justification of the faith of Christ. That's what Galatians 2 said. Therefore, being justified by faith, uh, Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we're at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing there, go back to Galatians 2, and watch what he says. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, 
knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Boom! Clear as a bell. How are you justified? By the faith of Jesus Christ. All the new translations will change that to end. It ain't your belief in Jesus Christ that got the justification done. The justification that was done was done by the faith of Christ. You can only believe in it. And when you believe in it, then you get the justification of Christ that was done. That's Romans 8, 29. He says, uh, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Boom. Let's see the order of it. God foreknew. He saw. Okay? In foreseeing, he predestinates. There's nothing going to waver. There's nothing going to be destroying uh, things happening in the world. The devil's worked all kinds of things, trying to kill Christians, trying to kill Jews, trying to kill anybody he could, trying to upset God's way. He even got the son killed, Jesus Christ, and in that killing, he died for our sin. He can't mess it up. The devil can't mess it up because it's predestinated by the foreknowledge of God. It is not just predestinated. It is predestinated by the foreknowledge of God. Never leave the word foreknowledge out. And so he predestinated. Uh, uh, moreover, he did predestinate. Then he also called. Boom. You're predestinated before you were born. God saw a time when he would call you. Pray to God you are. I hope you are. I hope you're called. I hope you're the called according to his purpose. You're getting called right now. The preaching of this message is calling you. Can you trust me? It's like God says, can you trust me? I have taken care of it all. It's finished. There is nothing, no scare tactics, no scare of any kind, no fear of any kind that can upset what I've done. I am almighty God. I am the creator of heaven and earth. I foresaw I predestinate, I call. And he says, then he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. He made the justification. It was done with Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ, look in Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, verse 24. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. By faith, Jesus Christ was willing to die and go into hell and wait for the Father to raise him from the dead. That's faith. That's his faith. And he, when he raised him from the dead, verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses. God delivered Jesus for our offenses. We don't need to tell him what we were. He knew what we were. We're offensive. And he delivered him for our offenses and raised him again for our justification. Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. And if he's raised from the dead, we're justified. Can we trust that? Do we feel justified? No. Do we feel scared? Yes. But can we know we're justified? Yes. How do we know we're justified? Because God said so. In Romans chapter 8 again. In Romans chapter 8 verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified even... Uh, them he also glorified. Now, with that in mind, we had to have an apostle to give us this message. Why? This was not the message of Peter and the 12 apostles. They were preachers of the Jews, the circumcision. But we find in a great verse, Galatians chapter 1, a man named Paul writes and he says in Galatians chapter 1, verse uh, 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. And by the way, you put that in your own mind. God separated you from your mother's womb and let you live. Uh, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, if Christ lived in you, Romans 8, 31 through the end of the chapter, which we're going to deal with in just a minute, uh, there ain't nothing going to separate you. Now watch. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son to me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. The revealing of the understanding, happy as a man that gets it, the revealing of the understanding is through the Apostle Paul to the heathen. That's us. We're not the Jews. We're the Gentiles. And he's called the Apostle of the Gentiles 
and he magnified his office. People around us, preachers, are not magnifying the office of Paul. Paul is the apostle of Gentiles. That means his message comes straight to us, and it'll be the gospel of peace because he's the preacher. He said, I'm the preacher, teacher, and apostle of the Gentiles. He is going to bring that gospel of peace through his writings, and the preachers are not giving us the gospel of peace. They give us a doctrine of if we get right with the Lord, then we need to keep right with the Lord. And if we don't keep right with the Lord, we're backslidden and we need to repent or rededicate and on and on. You cannot. You cannot do that because you cannot be separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And we'll read those verses in just a second. Now, the Acts 13, I want you to look what Paul says here. In Acts 13, man, if this isn't a great message when you think about it, I hear people say, well, if you don't quit doing that, God will get you. Where are you getting that at? If God was going to get us for not doing or not quitting, nobody would be alive. It's quite obvious. Well, in Acts 13, 38, Paul said for the first message he preached, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Through Jesus Christ is forgiveness of sins. Not confession. Not if we confess our sins. No, sir. It's through this man. Is preached unto you forgiveness of sin. And by him all that believe are justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. There is nothing that you're not justified from. You're justified from all things. Uh, I think about the Colossians. Uh, look in the Colossians chapter 1. The way people get you to walk an aisle or get you to give and rededicate and be continually a churchgoer and coming to church because you're afraid if you don't go to church, you're out of the will of God. In Colossians chapter 1, verse um, 20, uh, 19, for it, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, again, there's the peace, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies by, uh, in your mind by wicked works. You were convinced that you had wicked works in your life. And that made you not be able to have a relationship with God. A lot of people don't go and study the Bible because they know that they've done a lot of things wrong. And they think that those things that they've done wrong keeps them from having a relationship with God. That is so far from the truth in the Bible that you're reading this. The Colossians, Paul never went to Colossae in his life, but he wrote him a letter. And his letter tells him, he said, you believe you're alienated from God by wicked works. It's in your mind, you, you think, but not, you're not. That's what he wants them to know, you're not. Why? He said, verse 20, uh, 20, uh, 21, yet now hath he reconciled. Oh my God. I could be an individual that maybe go to church or never go to church because you've seen the things that they preach and heard the things you preach on TV and you say, well, I don't think God could ever deal with me. Uh, I've done too many things wicked and wrong and there's just no way that I could have a relationship with God and uh, God don't love me and whatever. God reconciled you. In Christ, he, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses. None of your trespasses are imputed to you. The gospel of peace is that you are reconciled. The gospel of peace is that God's not mad at you. God wants you to be saved. It's the will of God for you to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 4. God's not mad at you. God is not trying to throw wrath out on you. God's not throwing disease and viruses or anything else on the world. God wants you to be saved. He wants you to be saved because he wants to deliver you from this present evil world because of the faith of his son. His son gave himself that he might deliver you from the present evil world. God is not upset with us. The God of this world is Satan. Satan don't want us saved. And he makes every provision possible to keep the witness of Jesus Christ and the faith of Jesus Christ from being known in the world. He's trying to upset everybody to where they won't talk about Jesus Christ and the faith of Jesus Christ, and they won't do what they should talk about in the fact that they should walk in Him. Walking in Him and His 
glory, walking in Him and His works, walking in His workmanship, giving Him the glory, that we should be the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. We're to be telling people it isn't any matter of what happens. We're at peace with God. We're at peace with God. And boy, that'll make Romans 8 very clear. Turn to Romans 8 and look what he says in Romans 8. In Romans chapter 8, are you scared? Of course you are. But being scared is not a loss of salvation. Scared is what the flesh and the infirmity has. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31, what should we say to these things? You need 30 verses of things to read it. It starts out in Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit of God. Uh, after the Spirit. And you, you'll find that uh, we have Christ in us. We're not in the flesh. So the flesh, and the flesh can go away. The flesh can be dissolved. The flesh is not the important thing. It is the mind that will trust the Lord and trust the gospel of Christ. But in verse 31, what should we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? The world can't be against you. It won't matter. God ain't going to let the world take over. God's got it. He owns it. He owns it all. He lets the God's world do his thing. But all the things that the God's world does in evilness and vileness and bringing up the evilness of man and trying to destroy people and destroy, it's all to get at those that love God to them who are thee called according to his purpose. And as we're here with the infirmity of our flesh, we don't even know what we should pray for on this situation. Romans 8, 26 he said, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Oh, what a great verse when you think about it. We don't have the ability to know what to pray for, and the Spirit makes intercession for us. We cry and we moan. While Romans chapter 8, verse 23, uh, uh, I apologize, 22 for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now. This, this pandemic that's being talked about is global, they say, global. And so the whole globe, oh, I guess it is round, the global war, a world is crying and groaning and fearful and all that. Okay, they groan. The whole creation groans. All the people of the world are groaning. Verse 23. And not only they, but, but ourselves also. Is it right that we grow? We do. We're afraid. We're scared. We don't know the answers. We don't know what's coming about the world. We know what's coming biblically. We read it. But people that don't know it biblically are groaning without hope. We that are saved have hope. We read it with hope, knowing that God has it in hand and God can take care of it. Verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is not uh, that is that is seen is not hope. But for what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then we do pay with patience wait for it. So we can't go anywhere until God takes us. So what do we do? We wait with hope. We know that God's word is pure. We know that God's word will not fail. It will not return unto him void. And so we read his word and we see God said this, the creator of heaven and earth. Why should I doubt it? Why should I trust it? Do I understand it? No. But he'll give me understanding in things as I go. If I look at his word and be filled with the spirit, the spirit helps me with my infirmities. It intercedes for me up there. He is my mediator. He takes care of me. Well, what if I get sick? Well, let's read. Uh, look in verse 33, uh, 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The things that happened to Jesus were not for his account. It was for others. He gave himself. He died for our sins. So if things happen to us and the people in the, that are saved in the body of Christ in the world that groan within ourselves, if things are happening, it's happening for someone else. If he's going to direct our paths, it's to get somebody else to see the glorious gospel of Christ, the, the truth that could get them delivered from this present evil world. Verse 33, 
Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. There's nobody can blame you for being scared. There's nobody can blame you for, for uh, having uh, fear in this flesh. The flesh is vile. The flesh has no hope, you might say, except that if we were caught up alive, it could be changed. But the flesh is of non-use to God except for a presentation of a living sacrifice. We serve God in this flesh that has an infirmity. It is weak. It fears. It trembles. But in this flesh, we have a treasure, and that treasure is the gospel of Christ. And as that treasure, that spirit of the dear son, and that spirit can work out, and it works love. We are charitable. We put our body in a charitable mode, and we give it to somebody, even though maybe we don't like them, or we don't like what they're doing. Would I give it to the heads of state, the president, or anybody else? Yes, I would love to sit down with the president of the United States and witness to him and see if he knew the gospel of Christ, and if he didn't, he would trust the gospel of Christ. I would love to do it to Pelosi or any of them others. Why? Because they need to be saved. Salvation is the only thing that matters in this world. Salvation is how you get out of this world. And you ain't going to get saved because you changed your vile body. Why? Because that's the hope of a live person in the first place. Philippians 3.21, who shall change our vile body? The vile body ain't gone yet. You're living in it. And in living in it, your mind serves the law of God and the flesh, law, the law of sin. And there is no doubt. That's Paul writing. That's God's word. So I don't need to doubt it. And I don't have to look at myself and hate myself because I'm scared or I have fear. That is normal. That is the flesh. What I have to look at is, do I? You examine yourself. Am I in the faith? Do I keep the faith? Have I departed from the faith? Have I worked, uh, fought a good fight? Have I finished my course? Those things. I have to look at those things, and I look at them scriptural-wise because it's the only authority there is. I cannot depend on men. I depend on God. I trust in the Lord with all my heart. Well, he says in verse 35, um, 34, Who is he that condemneth? And I'm in Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So the intercession's being made. I don't even know what to pray for as I ought. I don't know how to pray about this virus. I don't know how to pray about what's coming tomorrow. I don't know how to pray for what's coming the next second. I have no idea. I know how to pray. It didn't say I didn't know how to pray. It said I don't know what to pray for as I ought. Why, if I don't know how to pray, why would he tell me to pray without ceasing? 1 Thessalonians 5 and Philippians chapter 4, uh, in all things of prayer and supplication with, with supplication with thanksgiving. I don't know what to pray for as I ought. I don't know how to straighten the situation up. I don't know how to make it better. I'm not going to try to make it better. I'm going to try to live in it. I'm going to try to serve in it. I'm going to try to exist in it. And I'm going to let God work it out because he will work it out. And I'm going to take what he says in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of, God, of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, perilous sword. Those things are going on around us all the time. He says in verse 36. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. It's not that we're going to have maybe a, a good life. It's we're, get, we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. The God of this world hates us. Satan hates us with every fiber of what he is. Why? Because we represent the truth in the message that Paul preached, the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. God wants people to be saved. Satan wants them to be lost. In 2 Corinthians 4, 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God's world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan don't want you saved. God wants you saved. Satan works every way he can possibly do. If he can use a virus, if he can use death, if he can use anything, to keep you from seeing the truth. If he can use a preacher not to preach the truth to you, if he can use religion or church building or traditions that you do to keep you from being saved, that's his work. That's what he wants. But God's will is that he would have all men to be saved. And he has faithful men who will preach to you. He has faithful men that if you will trust what they're reading and say to you by the gospel of Christ, led of the Spirit of God, you can be saved, sealed, and secure and in verse 37, 
Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor any other creature, I apologize. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. I'd say we're in a present time right now. Or things to come? Yes, it's coming. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This morning I was sitting at the breakfast table and my wife began to cry because she said she was scared. I said, I'm scared too. I'm scared for my grandkids. I'm scared for other people's kids. I'm scared for the things that happen because the things that are happening in this world could very well mean that the body of Christ could leave this world as in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I wonder what will happen to them. I wonder about people that I know that won't trust the gospel of Christ. I wonder about friends of, uh, of ours that won't even come and listen because they're either religious or they've been burned by religion and they are afraid they have to do something and they're not willing to do something or they don't think they have the ability to do something to get them right with God and they won't come and listen. I worry about all that. And yes, I'm scared. It's the scared of the unknown. But the unknown can be satisfied by the reading of the Apostle Paul. We know a man named Paul that he said, I knew a man whether in the body, out of body, such a one caught up third heaven, heard unspeakable words, unlawful for a man to utter. That man knew what it was like to leave and he came back to this earth with great knowledge, and the knowledge he got, Ephesians and Colossians, were not a prophecy, but total revelation, some things hidden God, and he gave, he, he gave them and written them, wrote them down, and they're probably the two of the most offensive, forgotten about, left out uh, chapters of books in the Bible that won't be preached in religion today because it absolutely gives you total freedom, it absolutely tells you how you're saved by grace. It tells you how you have redemption, even forgiveness. It tells you you're not subject to ordinances, that you're complete in Christ. I mean, these are all, you sit down and read Ephesians and Colossians in the King James Bible, and you will be overwhelmed by the true pureness and the peace that's in those books for us, ungodly sinners, us that were far off. Somebody came and preached to peace. To us, which were far off. Isn't that a great message? Somebody came and showed me that it didn't matter who I was and it didn't matter what I'd done. Jesus Christ had already died for my sins. He went down into hell and suffered for me, and then when God raised him, I was forgiven. I was justified. The day that I heard that, truly heard it for the first time in my mind's eye, I was at peace with God. As I live my life, I'm at standing before God. My standing before God is Ephesians chapter 1. God's not mad at me. And if anybody, if he could be mad at anybody, he could be mad at me. I am unworthy. I'm unworthy. Of the, he's let me be in a ministry for 30-something years, and I'm unworthy to be in that ministry. I am not worth, as my old friend used to say, I'm not worth the gunpowder. <clears throat> it'd take to blow me into hell I'm not worth it I'm not worth saving but God saw that I would believe him oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body that's death I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord that with the mind I serve the law of God and with the flesh the law of sin I can't get away from the flesh until I die or am changed I can't get away from the evil world the, the, the evil world that I live in and the evil men that are producing things and I can't get away from that unless God takes me but as long as I live or I'm here alive I have hope knowing that Jesus Christ makes intercession for me I know that nothing can separate me from the love of Christ I know that nothing can ever take me away from God for he sealed me and in that seal he says he sealed me and this is the condition he left me. My standing before God is, Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According to he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And in that foreknowledge, <clears throat> he gave us all things. 
He didn't spare anything. He let his son die, and he didn't spare anything. He gave it to us. He gave us all things. And as I live my life, nothing can separate me from it. And I praise God for that seal. I wished I'd have known I was sealed when I was young, but the preachers didn't tell me. The religion I was in didn't tell me. I was in the Baptist religion and didn't know it. I thought you had to hold on and get it, keep it. You had to repent or rededicate. You had to confess your sins when you committed sins. None of that's true. I am forgiven. I don't have to confess my sins. I confess the Lord Jesus Christ. I am sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, and nothing can separate me from the love of God. Greatest message of peace ever preached. Christ died for our sins. Yes, you're a sinner. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. Yes, you're unworthy. But Christ died for our sins anyway. We were ungodly sinners and enemies. And the gospel of peace is that God knew that and let his son die for our sins, according to the scripture, be buried and rose again the third day. I hope today, this moment, when you hear this, for the first time you junk your religion and trust the Lord for the first time and let him seal you. And the peace of God, which keeps all, uh, passes all understanding, if you dwell on that, it can keep you in this evil time, the lies that go on and the falsehoods that are being presented. In all of that, you can still be happy because you have found the understanding.